Hi, Vicky. Hi, Shane. Have you ever been in the position where you've been the liaison or a go-between between different people or groups, whether professionally or personally or anything like that? I try to avoid that at all costs. Oh, really? I hate, yeah, yeah. Well, at work, obviously, I do it. But sure. um, in my personal life, yeah, I I just avoid it. It's just mind. I can't, ugh, I can't even talk. I'm so, I hate it so much. But does, but does it have to be your... The way it's coming off is that you think of this as being a, com- a combative experience. You're bringing disparate groups to the table. Like it couldn't even just be friend groups meeting or something oh, like no, that. Oh, no, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking oh. about like, let's go to happy hour. You used to I run just, a meetup group. Yeah, I made the meetup and then people came or they didn't come. Oh, okay. I wasn't trying to like organize anybody around <laughs> a date or a place or anything like that. That's the thing. I can't. I can't do it if there's a group text happening or if I, I'll suggest what we should do and then I just like let it go where it will and then I show up at the thing like I'm not going to. See, I wish I wish I could do that. I don't want to be this person, but I, I am this person. Yeah. I am the I, I am the arranger, the organizer, the one that's trying to like tri- – I do it professionally all the time, sure, yeah, but personally sure. also trying to translate things back and forth. Mm-mm. And it just gets so deeply ingrained and involved and I care so much that – I'm always disappointed. And I, I set myself up for disappointment, but I'm just always disappointed. It's just, it's probably that, not very healthy. <laughs> no, I think that's why, that's one of the reasons I don't want to do it is because then if we go to the place and it was like so firmly my doing, mm-hmm. then what if people don't like my it? My friends don't like it or they don't have a good time or something weird happens and it's my fault. I was literally hanging out with a friend recently who I care for whatever reason, I care deeply about their opinion for and uncertain. For, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> who and knows? I just, I find I'm just constantly, I just, I just want their approval. I just yeah. want, we go out to a place to eat or we go to yeah. like a bar or a brewery or something. Like, what do you think? What's going on? I like this. Do you like this? And <laughs> they're, they're lovely. I think one of my best friends, but to a person always, yeah, sure. This was fine. Like, oh my gosh. Just. No, no. Yeah. Heart wrenching. <laughs> yeah. Science is fascinating, but don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Vicki Thompson. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. We are talking about being a go-between or liaising, which which is a word. No matter how many times I write it, I, I cannot spell liaison, liaising correctly. Uh, I, I just don't know why. But we're talking about this because our guest today is a bridge builder, a connector, a a liaiser. Is there any is there any other liaiser? <laughs> is there a way is that a right way to say this? Liaiser is not a word. It sounds like a fancy way of saying laser. No, it's <laughs> it's literally underlined in red in the document that we're looking at right now. Stop reading the document, Vicky. Stop, <laughs> stop stop adhering to the script that we planned out. <laughs> And you know what? Maybe it should be. Maybe it should be a word. Uh, but anyways, oh. we'll nope. We're gonna we're gonna okay. shoot right mm-hmm. past that. Go Not gonna it. let you rebut that. Uh, I will let our guest give himself a proper introduction. Our interviewer was Ashley Hamer. My name is Peter Falcon, and I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is which is nestled in the foothills of Pasadena, California. I am an Earth Science Communication Specialist. I'm also a GLOBE partner and a master trainer. And at NASA, we tend to wear a lot of hats. So I am the communications lead for the CloudSet mission. And really, my role is I act as a liaison between the engineers that build the instruments. So I understand how radar technology works, how lasers, spectrometers work. I also work with the scientists so I can understand the data, the importance of the data, what the colors mean, what's the societal benefit of the data. And then I turn around and and share this information with the general public, with teachers, and with students. And when I'm my other hat, when I'm doing the GLOBE program, I am a professional development workshop coordinator. I also work with teachers talking to them about the importance of making environmental measurements that coincide with NASA satellites. And then I also work with students, helping them with their research, helping them understand the data, how they can 
coordinate their observations with the satellite observations and kind of how to make heads or tails of the data, because it can be very, very difficult to see if you don't have a science background. I have a very atypical route to NASA, which is actually, as the more people I meet, it's not atypical at all. My degree is actually in behavioral science. So I was going to, to school for a psychology, to be a child psychologist. But as I was going to school full-time for that, I was actually working as intern at NASA. And the more I worked there, the more I learned. I asked lots of questions. And I just realized this is some cool work that we're doing here and I really want to be a part of it. So I just started working and asking lots of questions to everyone I met, engineers, scientists, communicators, educators, and I just started learning a lot and I really enjoyed it. So that's kind of how I got into JPL and that's how I've been there for 30 years. Oh, sweet. So how does, I mean, I understand you you did, well, what, what even inspired you to do an internship at NASA? How did, how did that happen when you were doing behavioral science? So I actually applied in December. I have an aunt who works at JPL as well, and she got me an application. I applied in December. Sometime in June, they called me, and I completely forgot. When they called and said, this is JPL, I thought, what's JPL again? And when I realized what it was, I right away took the call and said yes to everything they asked and stood there for about three months. And at the end of the summer, they really liked my work ethic. So they offered me a position to be an academic part-time employee, which I took. And it was great because when other college students are working at McDonald's and making money, I was learning science and learning how to put together professional presentations and, and learning about how to communicate to the people. So it was a great learning experience for me. And as I mentioned, it's NASA. Why would you ever want to leave? Is that how you feel about Third Pod? That you uh, you never want to leave? I kind of feel like your friend at the restaurant that you chose. Like you keep asking me. I think this is the second time this month that you've asked me about my commitment here. I'm just incredibly insecure. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just want people to like me. <laughs> Maybe just you. <laughs> oh. Well, I, 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 I'm not. I'm not worried about you leaving the podcast Vicky I, I think that you like this uh but maybe maybe we'll go yeah I think my biggest fear might be maybe one day we'll sign in the record and we'll do our intro and I'll go hi Vicky and you'll go I quit <laughs> oh okay I have to remember that because that's definitely how I'm gonna do it when I do it that I mean just mic drop at that point too just like knock it off the stand <laughs> yeah just fling everything across the room. Well, I, I say hopefully the day doesn't come, or at least doesn't come anytime soon. Uh, but getting getting back to Peter, frankly, he talked about his aunt and NASA. So we asked him about any other inspirations that he might have had on his journey. My inspiration. Well, you know, that one is... I. I... I am very family oriented. I have a huge family. And for me, my inspiration for just about anything in life has always been my grandmother, my well, Mexican background. So we call her Abuelita. Justina is her name. She's my inspiration because of the hard life that she lived. She left an abusive marriage in Mexico, took her eight kids, got their paperwork in order, left in the middle of the night, came to Los Angeles, to Boyle Heights, East Los Angeles. And not knowing the language, not having a job, she raised her kids, kept them off the streets, off of drugs, off of alcohol. And um, they say she ruled, ruled with an iron fist. When I look at my grandmother, she's like five feet. And I think, how can she do that? But to her credit, she raised eight wonderful kids. And from those kids, I have roughly about 80 cousins, second cousins, third cousins. And I'm very happy to say I'm the first to graduate from university. So anytime I have a any type of difficulty in life, in school, in work, and in, in personal life, when I think things are really bad for me, I turn around and look at my grandmother and I think I have her strength. So anytime I run into something difficult, I look for her as my inspiration to get over that hump. It wasn't until I got to university and really started taking a lot of different classes that you realize there's a lot of things out there to learn. And you just got hooked, you know, from a class to class. But, you know, it wasn't until I did that internship that I realized, hey, this is for me. I really enjoy this. I really enjoy working with people from different backgrounds, working with students from different areas as well. 
So I think for me, that was the key to getting into Tenasa is, is having that one foot in there, but also realizing I wanted to kick the door through and, and continue and put the other foot in as well. Okay, Shane, I'll ask you this one. Did you have any inspirational people in your life? You know, that's tough. I know we had this mentoring conversation a few weeks back. Right. And I, I don't know if there's a person I can point to as like a real inspiration or like I said before, a mentor. I will say though, my dad was an inspiration from a don't do this perspective. Oh. Uh, he was a blue collar electrician, very capable man, uh, like super, someone I very much look up to, even to this day. And my parents didn't pressure any of my brothers or myself to go into a certain career. My dad kind of strongly recommended that we not do anything in the construction perspective or per, uh, profession if we could help it. Just from a like, <laughs> he's like, this was a big, this was a good job for me and provided for our family, but like, don't do this. Uh, <laughs> so I guess pushing away versus pushing towards. That's interesting. I think that makes sense. My dad um, was a mechanic, always did super physical work. Yeah, and I feel like that really takes its toll on you. That's really what it was. Yeah, he, yeah. He, it meant like encourage this or discourage this, whichever way you want to look at it, in a very positive and caring way. Sure. Um, and and with Peter, back to the interview, with all of the successes that he had at NASA, we were we were very curious about all of the kind of not so successful points that he had in his career. I remember when I first started, I just got my full-time job. I was the communications lead for a mission, and we were, we had a lot of great science coming out. And my job was to make sure I posted that on our website. And the internet was big as, as it was as it is now. And there were so many articles written about the the data that I just grabbed one and posted it. Little did I know it was an opinion piece. And an NASA watchdog quickly jumped on that within 10, 20 minutes of me posting it and wrote, you know, something not very flattering about the post and why I decided to pick an opinion piece opposed to picking all these other articles, you know, that I could have selected. And I quickly contacted my media representative and said, hey, I, I think I messed up and I can use some help. And when I told him the problem, he said, don't do anything. I'll take care of it. Don't reply to him. Don't answer any phone calls because it will go public. And that's when I realized the importance of having great teammates on hand to help you through these difficult times who know their job. People are willing to help you. They're going to be there for you. So that was roughly about 20 years ago. And until this day, when I see this person, I always think, you saved my bacon. Yeah. Well, what was the biggest hurdle to you being here today? The biggest hurdle that I experienced in my career is often I would go to these conferences, these science conferences, and I will look around and I would look at the audience and I'm thinking PhD, two H PhDs, masters, masters and a PhD. And I'm looking around and I th would think I'm the, I'm the dumbest person in this room because I don't have a PhD. And so that really took a, a hit to my self-confidence. But then I realized when it was my turn to present, uh, I was the expert at what I did. I was the expert in communication and education and only I knew those things, whereas the other PhD scientists didn't. And that helped me kind of overcome that. It's something that I still have struggled with to this day is, you know, at NASA, there are a lot of smart people there. You heard of the, you know, A-type personalities. There's like triple A-type personalities, people that work there that literally sleep in the room in their office to get their work done. Um, it was difficult to kind of get over that. But the more experience I have, the more I realize, you know, I'm a pretty smart person too, and I have a lot to offer. So I don't feel that way as much, but it's difficult when you have so many different applications of science and, you know, you're not an expert in each one, but you do have to bone up on things and read up and do your research. And that's part of the challenge of working there is to make sure you know what's going on and your, your fingers are on the pulse of, you know, what's going on in the atmosphere, the ocean, the land, topography, all these different applications. It's difficult, but it's a challenge, but it's fun. Yeah. And remembering that you're the expert in the thing you're the expert in. Not everybody knows everything and you can teach even the smartest person something that you know a lot about. So that's, that's a great reminder. What about um, the per personal achievement that you're the most proud of? Oh, that, you know, I have an imperfect example. 
there's quite a few. One of them is, you know, I, I love working with students, young students. I think no matter what I'd be doing in life, I'm sure it would include working with kids because I have a lot of patience and I think I'm just a big kid myself. I still love video games. I love horror movies. My favorite thing is when I'm explaining a complex science concept and I do it in a way that they can understand. And then I see that light bulb go off in their head and they say, oh, I get it. You mean it's like that, 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 that. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I meant. And I feel really good about myself. I almost kind of like punch the air, if you will, because I feel like I just kind of planted a seed and now I can just step back and just kind of watch it germinate, watch it, you know, grow. So that's been one of my favorite things is, is being able to do that in a way that different students at different age ranges can understand. Another thing that I enjoyed was, as I mentioned, I get to go, go to a lot of different countries, work with a lot of different students from different backgrounds. And I was in Thailand and I did a presentation there. And there was a young student who the teacher had told me, you know, she was ready to get out of this science program because she wasn't, she felt she wasn't getting enough from it. And when I went to visit and talk to her, I, I guess, reinvigorated her, her interest in science. So she stood with the program. And then about two years later, she was a keynote speaker, one of four keynote speakers at our conference. And the, the teacher told me she is going to go off on to university with, a, I, believe, I believe it was some kind of science degree that she was going to get. And she said, you know, she was going to quit until you came. And now look where she's at. And I, I, at first, I didn't believe the teacher. But then when I met the student, she said the exact same thing. And it really, it kind of hit me right in the heart there. And I was like, oh, I did that. It, and it was just that really good that she was going to continue with her science degree. And then in Thailand, you know, a lot of times female students don't continue. So it was, it was great for me to see that and see where she's at today. You know, I hope someday that I can inspire someone like that. I bet you do already. Actually, through the oh. podcast, through your work on uh, on uh, story, blah, blah, blah. what's it called? Story Collider. Story Collider. Yeah, through all of the things that you do, you inspire people. Wow, Vicky, I got thank you. I wasn't expecting a sincere a, response. Oh. No. <laughs> Well, no, and I, I, I very much appreciate that. Thank you. I, I try to, um, like, I care a lot about what I do, and I try to work hard. Obviously, like we are here doing, doing our thing, but frankly, not too hard. I, I really try to find a balance of that kind of work life yeah. balance. I really care about my personal life and those relationships, and kind of related to that, we actually asked Peter how he finds balance in what he does. Yeah. You know, some people live to work. I am not one of those people. I have some colleagues that will work and then go home and watch NASA TV. I am not that guy. I much rather binge Netflix. So I realize, you know, life is too short. I am always cracking jokes at work, making people laugh. One of the things I enjoy doing is during work hours, I will take my team and we'll go to have lunch together or we'll go have coffee in the mall and just just talk about each other's lives. We'll talk about what's going on with each other's lives. And then we'll talk to people who come by. And it's at that point where I would introduce people since I've been there for a while. And at some point, we'll just start brainstorming about work. And it's rather than having one person do that one thing, now they're able to, you know, ask questions, kind of collaborate, get people's ideas. And all that happens because we just want to have a cup of coffee and just kind of shoot the breeze. So in one, in one hand, it's, you know, we're, we're, having a good time getting to know each other, bring more than just work colleagues, we're actually becoming friends, but we're also there to help each other out. So that is one way I do that. It may make my day a little longer, but it also makes it much more beneficial. My colleague jokes and she says, is there anyone you don't know here? Because when we walk to our meetings from one building to the next, I usually have to go about five to 10 minutes in advance because at some point I'm going to meet somebody I know and we're going to chit chat and we're going to talk and it could be somebody I know from softball, from JPL bowling, or, you know, some other social event that I do. And it really helps me with my work, but it also makes work that much more fun. So that really helps me with my mental stability and also, you know, getting to know people, becoming friends with my colleagues. That is absolutely true. I've got so much work done uh, joking and saying, you know, I will, I will let you hit the ball off me on the next softball game if you do this. And it actually does work. 
And as far as someone who might want to follow in your footsteps, what, what words of advice would you have for them? Get some coding background. I know when you apply to JPL, it's going to ask you what languages you speak. It's not referring to English, math, or French. It's referring to Java, Python, C++. So the faster students get some programming background, the better off they're going to be. I would also say that, um, you know, there's if you Google 21st century skill sets, these are skill sets that students are going to need in their educational career as well as their professional career. Things like how to communicate, how to think creatively, how to work in collaboration with people. These are skill sets that they're going to need to develop if they don't already have them developed. So I would encourage them to look at those skill sets and work on them if they don't already have them developed. One of the neat things about today's youth is when I work with students and I see what they're doing, I look back at my years when I was at age and I realize, oh my God, you are so much more advanced than I was at age 12. And when I see interns working today, I look at you know the, the qualifications and I often think, oh my God, I am not qualified to, to do my own job because there's so much more that they're learning today, so much more skill sets that they already have developed. I think in science and in society in general is, you know, misinformation is really a big thing for us. People tend to grab certain data that fits their narrative, and it's really difficult to get past that. You know, it's a fact, you know, with with science that our planet is changing. I'm very optimistic with today's youth, with Generation Z, they seem to be very educated in environmental issues. So I'm really looking forward to seeing when they come of age, because I think they understand now that when adults do something, you know, inactive when it comes to policy change, environmental issues, that that uh, problem gets kicked down the road to them. So I see them being more vocal. So as they come of age, I can, I hope And I'm very optimistic that we'll start to see change when they start to vote and and be able to say, you know, what's on their mind. So, Vicky, do you uh, do you want to say what's on your mind right now? Do we do we want to do I want to hear what's on your mind? You were really nice last time. What else you got? Yeah. Oh, well, nope. <laughs> nope. Well, I feel like it's like one of those cartoons where it's like you think the other person's thinking a really deep thought or, oh. or something. And I'm just like looking at this orange that's next to my computer <laughs> and like really excited to eat it when we get off the line. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, frankly, <laughs> most of the time when we're on these recordings and if, uh, if anyone's there, if anyone like watches the videos of these, they can see our backgrounds and such. But I, I have this this cutout of my dog in yeah. my studio that has always has a hat on it, and right now it has like a pirate's hat on it, the Pittsburgh right. Pirates, the baseball team. And every time we rec- literally every time we record, I look at that and go, oh, could I attach that to his head better? Would there be a better way to put that on there? I just yeah. I don't know. Like these are the deep thoughts that we have in our brains. Um, yeah, we're doing good work, Vicky. <laughs> good. We're not we're not distracted at all. No, no, not at all. Uh, but I will say, uh, like to be serious, I I really want to thank uh, Peter for one like, keeping us on track. You know, then us just like right, just gallivanting here uh, on our commentary, <laughs> uh, and for all the great work he does, and for sitting down to chat with us. We we really appreciate it. And so with that, uh, that is all from Third Pod from the Sun. Special thanks to Ashley Hamer for conducting the interview and to NASA for sponsoring the series. This episode was produced by Zoe Swiss and me with audio engineering from Colin Warren and artwork by Karen Romano Young. We'd love to hear your thoughts, so please rate and review us and you can find new episodes on your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next week. While you were talking, I was looking at the word liaising really closely, and it makes sense how it's spelled now. Like, I've never looked at it this close, but I can't spell it either. But it's like liaising. But why is there a L-I? second I? But why is there a second I in it? So how do you spell raising? Oh, darn it, Vicky, you are mm-hmm. right. That's why it makes sense now. I still won't be able to spell it, but... I'm a I'm a very good communicator, but mm-hmm. when it comes to the written word, that's not that's why I, I thrive 
in an creaky. audio medium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know what I want to say. I just don't know how to spell the thing I want to say. Okay. It's okay. 